Welcome, this is Brian Wood, Medical Director for the Mountain West AETC Project ECHO Telehealth Program. Each of our weekly sessions starts with a short talk focused on issues relevant to HIV clinical medicine. The following talk was recorded live here at University of Washington. We will now take you to this week's talk. Great, thank you. We could not have timed this better for the guidelines that came out last week. And I am definitely going to give a shout out here publicly to Pam, who fixed my slides, made them clearer for you. So there are a lot of new things in these guidelines. It's very sort of rich in conversation about all things PrEP. So I'd encourage you to read them. The link, skip my disclosures, but the links are here. You can go click on them yourselves. I'm just going to pull out the things that I thought were most interesting and relevant and some things that are different from the last time we talked about what the draft guidelines were and what we thought they were going to look like. So here, the top two are the new guidelines, the supplement that includes some risk scores for you for the MSM risk score, as well as this risk score for people who inject drugs. And then the IAS USA guidelines that are slightly different in some places. And then if you have any questions about PrEP, you are always, of course, welcome to call me or email me or there is a PrEP warm line and the resources are down there. So I, I think one of the big things that CDC did when they were putting this together was trying to simplify as much as possible. So for folks who have looked at the previous guidelines, there were three or four boxes that were just about eligibility for different populations, they've collapsed that into a single table that you can see here for both, again, all sexually active adults and adolescents weighing over 35 kilograms, of course, and then people who inject drugs. Also some very simplified summaries of eligibility for how to write dosing and for what labs to order. This is not everything, but for the person who just wants a quick glance, this is actually a great table. And I wanna point out a few things. The first, just again, about eligibility, that they are putting it all in one place. They've changed it from the estimated creatinine clearance of 60 mils per minute, which of course was not relevant for FTC-TAF, which is brand name Descovy, as you all know. So they've lowered the estimated creatinine clearance for folks to be above 30 mils. They've added lists of contraindicated medications to these guidelines, which I'm not going to review with you. St. John's wort is the one that comes up right now for folks on Descovy. And just there is, again, more richness that I'd encourage you to look at. They've added Descovy. The guidelines came out prior to FDA approval. So for everyone, it is appropriate to write for daily oral FTC TDF, brand name Truvada, which of course is now available as a generic with, again, the recommendation to prescribe a 90-day supply. We'll talk about 2-1-1 dosing, which they also mention again here with some endorsement, but also a new recommendation for FTC-TAF for, again, specifying in men and transgender women only because the data are not yet available for cisgender women. A little bit of sort of nitty gritty stuff. One of the things that they're recommending for oral prep is, again, a negative laboratory-based antigen antibody test, what we used to call a fourth generation HIV test within one week of starting. But new in these guidelines is this recommendation for oral prep in follow-up tests that an RNA test should be done. We'll talk about this in a bit. We can have some discussion about it later. There's now a recommendation to do STI screening for men who have sex with men and transgender women who have sex with men every three months at all sites. Previously, you may remember that the recommendation was for testing every six months and screening for symptomatic folks every three months, but that we'd miss a bunch with asymptomatic STI. So now the recommendation is every three months in men who have sex with men. There are a couple confusing things in this table. The first is if you look and you read these guidelines, the first couple pages has a text summary. They fell into the problem of sort of, you know, double negatives in that. So in terms of calculation of estimated creatinine clearance, the new recommendation is that for people who are either over 50 
or who have an estimated creatinine clearance at baseline of under 90 mils per minute to do follow-up creatinine testing every six months and for everybody else to do it annually. They have an and or problem. So if you get confused by this, this table is correct that people who have no indication for more frequent screening should have testing done every year. Anybody with an indication, either one of these indications should have screening every six months. There's another confusing thing. It took me a couple of reads to figure this one out, that for non-men who have sex with men, that there should be bacterial STI screening every six months, and then it says chlamydia screening every year. And there's a footnote in this table, which I missed the first time through, that when they refer to bacterial STI screening in folks who are not men who have sex with men or transgender women, they are only talking about gonorrhea and chlamydia. They could have worded this slightly better, but so gonor- for heterosexual folks or folks who are not men who have sex with men and transgender women, they should have gonorrhea and syphilis screening every six months and chlamydia screening every year. And then new in the guidelines, again, because FTCTF is new, there is a new recommendation to check triglycerides and cholesterol levels annually. Just like with the IAS USA guidelines, we knew that these guidelines were being held because of the 083 and 084 data suggesting that injectable cabotegravir administered every two months was going to be superior to oral FTC TDF. We knew that this was going to appear in the guidance. I'm not going to talk about this guidance any more than that it exists. We can talk a little bit about the RNA testing issue because there's, again, a slight conflict here, but the recommendation for injectable cabotegravir is going to be for anybody starting cabotegravir or during follow-up, they should have also have an antigen antibody test and an HIV RNA test. So there's text that contradicts this box. I will, I'm sure, in early 2022, be talking about injectable cabotegravir. We're expecting FDA approval in late January and probably availability, if you're going to have availability to it, in February at some point. The other thing, in addition to the RNA testing around cabotegravir that we've talked about and didn't know what they were going to do about is around the one-month oral lead-in period and about the tail. They basically ignored the oral phase at the beginning. It's entirely optional for people and don't even recommend it. In terms of the tail, this is what that extra box is down at the bottom. When you are discontinuing cabotegravir, you're supposed to talk about the tail. The issue is that cabotegravir will hang around for a while. It puts someone at risk as the levels drop down for not having sufficient prevention benefit from having that extra cabotegravir hanging around with therefore the potential for drug resistance. So there was some question about whether or not they were going to recommend that everybody go on oral prep while the tail was coming down. And what they've done is to say, you should talk about the tail for people who have ongoing PrEP needs to transition to oral PrEP if the person is going to discontinue injectable PrEP, but there's no recommendation for a tail in follow for people who are completely discontinuing it. So in terms of who should be prescribed PrEP, the new thing is this initial statement that's here, recognizing that we haven't gotten PrEP to everybody who needs it, particularly populations of color, of folks who are disproportionately impacted by HIV, that we the uptake of PrEP remains low, lower than folks who are white and at need for PrEP. So there's new, a new recommendation that all, just like with HIV testing, all sexually active adults and adolescents should receive information about PrEP. This is based on expert opinion, of course. Statements about who should be on FTC TDF, for sexually activity as well as injection drugs. And then they come out here with an explicit statement in discordant couples, which we've talked about before, which I think is interesting. So in discordant couples, that is in a couple where one person is HIV positive and one person is HIV negative, we know that based on U equals U, that the person who is HIV positive has a negligible, if not zero, chance of transmitting to their partners. 
So therefore, PrEP should be indicated in these couples in which the partner is inconsistently viral suppressed or their viral load is unknown, or of course, if the HIV negative partner has other sexual partners. But the statement that's new in here is the explicit statement that if the negative partner wants the additional reassurance of protection, even despite U equals U. And I think this speaks, and we'll go through a couple figures in a bit, that sort of really sort of comes at this push-pull between public health perspective, where we want the folks who are at highest risk to be receiving PrEP, with the individual sort of care that we want to provide to patients, and to say if someone wants PrEP and will be reassured by it and has some risk, that we should not be denying PrEP to people. So a negative person in a discordant couple where the HIV-positive partner is undetectable it is certainly reasonable to prescribe PrEP to that person, according to the CDC. They've done these nice algorithms, which I really like for people to work through in terms of providers thinking, like, is PrEP right for this person? But I want to come back to what I just mentioned about sort of the CDC being permissive about anybody who wants to be on PrEP should be on PrEP. So let's just go back to this is the algorithm for folks who are sexually active. The next one is going to be for people who inject drugs. But if you say, you know, have you had anal or vaginal sex in the, in the past six months? And you say no, you're still supposed to discuss PrEP and prescribe if it's requested. So all of these light green boxes are, you know, even if the person doesn't meet the indications for what we think from a public health perspective of people who should be on PrEP, where it's saying, you know, do, do you have an HIV positive partner with a unknown detectable viral load? Yes, prescribe PrEP. But even if they don't talk about PrEP and think about prescribing it. So it's gotten, the CDC has gotten even broader in terms of who they suggest we should be having conversations about PrEP with and about not denying PrEP to people who might be interested. I'm not going to walk through this. It's not different than what we've talked about in the past, except for that explicit statement about prescribing for people who are requested. This is the one for people who inject drugs. It's, again, very similar. Have you ever inject drugs? No. Prescribe if requested. So if you follow down to the dark green, these are, of course, the people who we would like to be on PrEP because their risk is higher. But again, prescribe for people who are interested. So what to prescribe? This is sort of just the new things in these guidelines. There's obviously more detail in the guidelines. They came out explicitly about saying for most patients, no need to switch from FTC-TDF to FTC-TF. Obviously, a lot of this is based on the availability of a generic at less cost to the patient into the system. Specifically, exceptions are if you have patients with an estimated creatinine clearance by the cockcroft galt of 30 to 60, and that for some patients that you might prefer to prescribe FTC-TDF if they have documented osteoporosis or related bone disease. What to prescribe? Again, the CDC is based on the FDA, so they've, they've sort of loosened a little bit based on what data are out there. So for all populations, daily oral prep with FTC-TDF, as we talked about before, FTC-TF is recommended as an alternative for cisgender men and transgender women. So there's nothing really new in what I'm saying there. There's nothing new in this statement that you shouldn't use anything other than what they talk about. And then as we anticipated, there was going to be a recommendation and a statement in favor of cabotegravir once it becomes available. How to prescribe PrEP? Sorry about this slide. I'm not going to read this to you. I just wanted to share two things that they are now actually speaking to. First is same-day PrEP, and they're very explicit about who same-day PrEP might not be appropriate for, and you can read this on your own. But also that this is down below is the statement about 211 or event-based dosing, which is, of course, when people take two FTC-TDF pills, two to 24 hours prior to sex, one pill 24 hours after that, and one pill 24 hours after that. And this is their statement. I didn't put it in quotes because I think I edited for space, but it's effectively that you may choose to prescribe off-label FTC-TDF using 211 dosing for adult men who have sex with men, so no other populations who have sex less than once a week and they can anticipate sex. 
So not surprising of who they've talked about it for, just that they've included this, whereas previously they've said that 211 or event-based dosing was that you should not use this. It is, of course, an alternative in other parts of the world. For baseline testing, I include this mostly because it is similar, but people have asked me about it, that HIV testing should occur within the first week of starting PrEP. Ideally, it's an antigen antibody-based test. That point of care, same day testing is okay if you're prescribing it on the same day and based solely on those point of care tests. But they always recommend that a laboratory antigen antibody test be ordered at the same time. They, in fact, say if you can get those results same day, you shouldn't base your results on a point of care test. And then, of course, again, oral fluid tests should not be used. Monitoring, and I'm going to go quickly because I think I'm running out of time, or maybe I'm running out of time. So again, the biggest thing is about HIV testing. So the recommendation for interval remains every three months for folks on oral prep. It's going to be every two months for folks receiving cab injections. That's the frequency of injections every two months. I mentioned the checks of creatinine and estimated creatinine clearance. And just to note that as we get into injectable cab, that the only interval monitoring is for HIV STI testing. And they mentioned the cab may be an alternative for folks who have estimated creatinine clearance under 30, but we'll wait to see what the FDA says. So this is the new surprising thing to me. This is this, they had this figure, equivalent figure in the previous guidelines, but the recommendation again at monitoring for whichever oral or injectable prep, you should be doing an HIV RNA test in addition to the antigen antibody test, regardless of the results of that antigen antibody test. And then it goes through again, how do you diagnose HIV infection? But I was again, surprised. I'm not gonna go through the data that supports this. This is primarily based on 083 and 084 data because it had both obviously cabotegravir as well as a FTC TDF arm. And in both cases, there were delays in diagnosis by the antigen antibody test in individuals who would have been picked up by RNA testing. Again, the number is super small, so I'm not, and there was no modeling done, they tell me, to estimate this, but I guess they felt that at this point, if we're going to be prescribing PrEP, we should make sure that we are catching HIV as soon as possible to try to limit the drug resistance that occurs. But I think my next slide is a poll for you all. And I'm just interested in hearing how feasible will it be for you, for those of you who prescribe PrEP, will it be to do this monitoring for RNA? So is it going to be no problem at all for none of, no problem at all for none of your patients? I'm all about the double negatives today. No problem at all. Or will it be no problem for your insured patients, but it won't be feasible for your uninsured patients? Is it not feasible currently because you have no access to a diagnostic NAT. Some labs are very particular about whether or not they can do a viral load test, or will it not ever likely be feasible because of your situations? Okay. So sort of split between no problem at all and not feasible for uninsured folks, with that actually representing the most, with a small number of folks saying it's not feasible because you currently don't have access to a diagnostic NAT. Thank you very much for sharing that. I'm going to answer those chat questions once I go through my slides, if that's okay, because I'm almost done. There's another box around adherence support for your folks. Again, we all know that adherence is important for efficacy. I'm not, again, going to read these to you, but they give you some strategies for how to support adherence in your patients. Okay. That was my last slide. I'm going to stop sharing. Sorry about running over a little bit. Thank you for watching this edition of the Mountain West AETC Project Echo Didactic Series. If you like this talk, please click the red subscribe button and please check out other talks in our series. Until next time, this is Brian Wood, Medical Director, signing off.